Okay, Elena, all set? Yes, all set. Great, thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm calling this public hearing to order in accordance with the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, MGLC 131, Section 40, and the Boston Wetlands Ordinance, Boston City Code Ordinances, Chapter 7-1.4. The Boston Conservation Commission is holding this virtual public hearing uh, on November 15th, 2023, to review the following projects to determine what conditions, if any, the Commission will impose in order to protect the interests of the public and private water supply, groundwater, prevention of pollution, flood control, prevention of storm damage, protection of fisheries and land containing shellfish, and protection of wildlife habitat. Uh, this evening's uh, public hearing will be followed by our regular meeting. And in accordance with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, we are conducting this meeting online. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Conservation Commission, the public may access this call through telephone and video conferencing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Additionally, the meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please turn off your video. Members of the public may have an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comment on applications and discussions. To do so, please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccfboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston and Byron using the hashtag concom. Um, for the record, I am Michael Parker, Chair of the Commission. Uh, could staff who are present please identify themselves? Elena Itamary with the Environment Department. Didi Hernandez with the Environment Department. Christopher? Okay. Christopher's here somewhere. Okay, uh, let me call the role of uh, commissioners who are present. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan? John Sullivan. Commissioner Long. Nick Long. Uh, Commissioner Conan. Conan Tivangram. I'm here, Chair Parker. Great. Uh, Commissioner Herbst. Ann Herbst. Fantastic. Okay. First item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number 006197 in Boston file number 2023-02062 yeah, from the Vertex Companies LLC on behalf of the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation for the proposed construction of a new pavilion and removal replacement of self-contained toilets located on George's Island in Boston. Resource areas land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, we... Um, we have heard this, we are waiting for a DEP file number. It looks like we have it. Elena, is there anything else on this? Uh, we also have the conditions ready to go. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, I don't think we need a hearing. Who's here on behalf of the uh, applicant, if anyone? Yeah. And when I said hearing, I meant I don't think we need a presentation. We're obviously in a hearing. Okay, so uh, no one here for the applicant. Um, Elena, anybody from the public um, raise their hand? I'm not seeing any raised hands and we also didn't receive any emails about this. Okay, fantastic. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to close the hearing and issue the order conditions. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries 5 nothing. Okay. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Ralph Silver from DCR uh, was logging on. I should know better. You cannot be three minutes late in a virtual meeting. So I can't. Absolutely not. Time. Thank Especially you this much. one, but um, we just closed the hearing uh, and All issued set. the order of conditions. So. All set. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number 0061970 and Boston file number 2023-060 from Childs Engineering on behalf of Charlestown Commerce Center Realty Trust for the proposed installation of a stone riprap revetment within a washed out area of the existing deteriorated seawall located at 50 Terminal Street in Charlestown. Resource areas are riverfront, waterfront, uh, designated port area, coastal bank and land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, same situation as the uh, first NOI, um, we continued this solely uh, for to enable the applicant to get their DEP file number and Boston file number. Uh, I see they have them now. Elena, is there anything else on this? Similarly, we have conditions ready to go. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, any um, raised hands from the public? 
I'm seeing no raised hands and nothing in the inbox either. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to uh, issue the order of conditions and close the hearing. So moved. We have a second. Second. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. Aye. And I vote aye, that carries five nothing. Okay, next item is a notice of intent for DEP file number 0061957 in Boston file number 2023-047 from Norwood Engineering on behalf of CAD Builders for the proposed construction of a single family home with a pertinent utilities located at 14 Toucan Road in West, West Roxbury. Resource area is 100 foot buffer to um, bordering vegetated wetlands. Um, I'm going to recuse myself from this one because some of the underlying matter um, had something to do with representation um, by our firm of, I think, in a butter here. Uh, so with that, I would entertain a motion uh, to appoint Commissioner Herbst as acting chair for this hearing. So moved. We have a second. Second. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. Aye. I enthusiastically vote aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who's here for the proponent to take this? Um, hi, Alex Kraplin, Norwood Engineering. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, hello, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Alex Kraplin, as I just said. Uh, I'm an engineer with Norwood Engineering Company. And I'm here on behalf of CAD Builder, Builders LLC regarding this notice of intent uh, for lot 13 on Toucan Road in West Roxbury. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide basically just shows the existing conditions of the site. Uh, it's an empty lot at the moment. You can see uh, the wetland up at the top of the screen with contours going down towards Toucan Road, and then you can also see the 100 foot um, buffer zone line in the dash blue line below. Uh, the thick blue line is the wetland. Um, next slide. Awesome. Uh, the proposed work here is best described as the development of a single family house with work proposed within the 100 foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands. Uh, the house will have a proposed attached two-car garage and a patio in the rear. Prior to the start of earth moving activities, an erosion control barrier consisting of entrenched cetacean fence uh, fronted by wattles will be installed, which will also serve as the limit of work. Uh, the erosion control barrier will be maintained until the site is stabilized by building, pavement, and uh, vegetation. Uh, the proposed retaining walls uh, at the rear will generally decrease the slope to the south and across the lot as well. Um, and then the proposed project does result in increased impervious surface with, within the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, however, the lot is included in the infiltration system in Toucan Road to address the one inch over uh, runoff for the proposed impervious surfaces to the lot. Uh, and then the approval from the issuing authority will be received prior to the removal of any erosion control barriers. Um, next slide, please. Um, sorry, one more, that was just some details. And then here's uh, the landscaping plan we have. Um, it's provided by Verdant Group and it just shows um, the vegetation that we're proposing um, and plantings we're proposing uh, on the lot. Uh, so in conclusion, we request your approval here for this project today, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to call on myself first as I uh, did a site visit here this week. Um, and I just to remind commissioners, in case this looks familiar, this project is part of a relatively large subdivision of single family homes that's going in where we have uh, a couple of uh, fairly extensive wetlands violations that occurred and, and restoration that's underway. So one is along Willette Street, which is not where this is today, and one is uh, is along this street. Um, so, and I'm sorry that I don't 
have an answer to I mean, some of the things that I might have, we might have been able to figure out today, but I'm actually not clear exactly where we are in the restoration process. I know that there's a requirement, you know, several years seeing how it goes and that at that point, the silt fence is supposed to come down. I did see some silt fence along the property. Um, but uh, other questions in terms of your proposal, um, the your plan says that the uh, topography was done somewhere between October 16th and October 21st. And there has been a lot of change since then, but, you know, till October 19, this was a fully wooded lot. Uh, and even since October 21st, looking on Google earth, there's been a fair amount of change on the property earth moving. Um, so I am concerned that the plan doesn't really make it possible for us to understand how you're changing the topography from what it is today or what it once was and how that potentially could affect the wetlands. So I'll be interested in the thoughts of other commissioners, but I, I think we may need another survey to understand that if you if you had pre pre activity surveys to understand what it once was, I think that would be helpful. Um, I also think for uh, another site visit, if you could stake the corners of the property and, and the natural area, um, that would be helpful. Um, and and I and in terms of topography, I think it's, I'm most interested in understanding how the land will slope down towards that water area and, and, and potential impacts there. Uh, and I'll turn go it over ahead. to, go ahead. If I can comment to that. Um, so the, slope is actually, I don't know if, um, sorry, I just somehow minimized my screen and lost everything. Oh, there it goes. Um, so it, the wetland is actually a lot higher than the site itself. Um, the how it, so it's actually sloping the, the wetland. Um, it's, I, I don't remember exactly what contour, um, it's at, but the, the lot itself, uh, goes downwards from, um, from the wetland. Uh, so th it, that's just the comment that I have at the moment. Okay. John well, Rockwood from EchoTech. Let um, me just, uh, I'll be happy to take your comment. Thank you. I, um, and, and maybe this will help if you stake it out, being out on the site today that that wasn't, it appears that it heads down towards the water there, but, and I'm sorry to cut you off, Mr. Rockwood, go ahead. No problem. Um, I've been supervising the restoration work on that property. And um, that area was altered as part of the other work that occurred on the site originally. And it's not part of the site that was proposed to be restored. We did restore all of the area um, that was impacted within the uh, natural open space area. And we've actually, from this site, we've actually provided four letters. The most recent ones were just sent a couple or three weeks ago to the uh, commission to document the uh, existing conditions of the restoration area um, around the uh, wetland to the uh, north of the site. And there was also one for the wetland uh, rep, uh, restoration area and the buffer zone restoration area off of Willett Street. So, so there are two monitoring reports for the Willett Street one and four monitoring reports for the, um, the school slash um, northern part of the site um, restoration area. And basically the restoration area is doing well. We actually planted 30 additional saplings um, this fall to address some uh, dieback that occurred because of uh, the hydrology on the site. The wetland was redelineated last fall after the, about a year after the restoration work was done. And the wetland is actually located at a higher elevation. It's perched above the site. So the site is actually down gradient of the wetland. So water, nothing can get from the site up to the wetland because nothing flows uphill. So the, it's basically, we have erosion controls, but they're really just shown as a matter of convention. They're not really doing anything other than establishing a limit of work. They're not protecting the wetland from erosion because again, water and sediment does not flow uphill. So I just wanted to provide some clarification on that. You know, Alex has worked on the plans, but I've been on this site 
a lot of the time over the last three or four years relative to delineations and the restoration and supervising the restoration and monitoring the restoration. Okay, thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking at that. It looks like the, I do see some lower elevation from the, um, where there's ledge and I'm not clear if you're planning to take that out, but. Uh... In other words, there's ledge that's higher than the wetlands now and the wetlands are lower and it looks like you've got a, um, you're retaining wall going, and I don't know if it's actually going up and over or whether you're planning to remove ledge. Are you having trouble unmuting? Yeah, yourself? sorry. It, uh, Zoom's not my friend tonight. Um, so in regard to the ledge, um, the ledge is actually going to, uh, it's it's still, I mean, it we're grading kind of over it, um, but that being said, the the ledge is at 240 feet, um, and then the wetland is at it, it's between it 240 point seven point nine 241 242, um, it kind of goes along that, and then the wall is at 240 and a half, and it's a four foot wall, or well five foot wall to be able to go to 245.5. Um, and then after that, it slopes back, but not towards the, I mean, it's, it, it slopes towards the natural open space area that you see there, but not exactly towards the wetland. Um, if you look up towards the wall, it does go 244, 242, which does signify that just that small section could go towards the wetland, but it's not, it, it, it's just a very small triangle right there. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, okay, uh, I think I'll let other commissioners get their chance to ask questions. Commissioner Sullivan? Yeah, uh, this building will have a full basement. Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah, I was just curious what the groundwater levels are, given that you've got a, a, a wetland or the potential of a higher, or maybe it's perched, I don't know. Um, but have they done any excavation at all there to see where the water table is? Um, I can't comment to that. I'm not sure, but we could get that information back to you. Yeah, I'm concerned if they if they were getting seasonal water, high groundwater levels, if they built a French drain to avoid that going in the house, where does that water kind of go? Um, right. Uh, yeah, we can get that information back to you. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure. I know you've got a, a you know, a major two con street, uh, infiltration system and that's already been in so they might be able to check that and see what's up it just seems strange with this water higher than your house um it, it's you know oh, the potential for a lot of water you know with a big big rainstorm for to be filling in the wetlands so that was just my concern okay thank you yeah we'll we'll, we'll get back to you on that yeah that's all i had thank you commissioner long thank you um I've been having trouble seeing the uh, limit of work with the erosion control on the plan. Would uh, Alex or John, would you be able to direct our attention to that, please, on the submitted plans? Sure, it should be. Um, it's at the top of the slope, it's a gray dash line, and then going down. Um, the natural open space area that it's it's the it, it follows that green dash line so um if we can label that slightly better yeah i think just just making it more clear um would be really helpful and i think is a you know reasonable ask um sure. sort of outing myself as somebody who's still <laughs> trying to piece these things together right um <clears throat> so yeah i do i do share commissioner herp's kind of interest in um, a potential future site visit, depending on how other commissioners are feeling tonight. Um, I know that a, a lot of people here have been on the site before, um, including proponents and uh, Dr. Rockwood. And, it, you know, we all recognize that the area is, you know, adjacent to the lot, not in the lot, but not too far, um, you know, a really high quality habitat, owing in part to the restoration work that's happened. I know, um, 
Dr. Rockwood even restored a vernal pool in that area, I believe, or um, in somewhere in the region. So I think um, that'd be something I'd be interested in doing soon. But uh, a lot of my questions are more so about the uh, natural open space area. I don't know, I, I believe I was through the development process with the BPDA. Has there been anything before the commission confirming who's going to own the land? Um, I know it's owned by the developer now, but how how does that open space area kind of work uh, in the future, in the long term? I don't have an answer to that yeah. question. That's something that I could also get back to you. Okay. Especially there is um, going to be signage that's mm -hmm. going to go up. It's part of the restoration. And right. if you look on the plan, there's also a four foot wide green space access easement with some stairs and retaining walls to right. provide public access up to that area. The other thing is there's actually going to be no trespassing signs along the property line between the school and the development because part of the restoration work was actually on the uh, Roxbury Latin School property. So, so how, uh, okay, go ahead. Three sets of signs are going to go up. One is how to obtain access to the area. The other is going to be demarcating the area to prevent future accidental intrusion into it by the owners of the properties. And the last would be the no trespassing signs along the actual property boundary with the school. I'm glad you mentioned the... Um access easement i'm wondering how is that uh access easement codified it's shown on this plan which is and it's actually on this lot it's shown on this plan it's also on plans that were included in the restoration and mm -hmm. i assume it's on plans that were approved through some type of development process would have to check with um the developer on that yeah i think um I, I I've seen it on the plan and I, I recognize that I think I'm I'm just wondering how we might be assured that the access will remain open to the public or what if there's an intended timeline for um you know keeping it open in general for the public in the neighborhood. Yeah, there is there is an access easement there. So I have to assume that there's some document that's either been prepared or recorded. And we'll have to follow up with the developer on that. Okay. Yeah, I think that that would be great to see that just so we have documentation across kind of our various, you know, agencies within the government. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the work that's gone on in this area. You know, obviously a lot of things have needed correction, not because of what people here tonight have done, but um, I just want to recognize Dr. Rockwood's work in this area. Um, but that's about it that I had for questions. Um, I'll kind of leave it to other commissioners to maybe ask about some more grading questions or other things, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Connor. Thank you, Chair Erbst. Um, the, I, I wanna pick up on the access question before I go to understanding the topography. I had trouble also, I don't know, uh, Chair, if. In the future, we could also request a topographical map that's a little bit more readable. There's so much here, it's just um, just just a little difficult, but if it could also be laid out in a vertical format, that might also just make it plainly obvious where, you know, where the slopes are. It's, it's hard to figure out the dynamics of the hydrology given this map to know what the impact on the wetland would be. So that's a general comment, but I want to get back to the access to the natural open space. Is the access for the full space or part of it or a path or something? What, what, what is the nature of the access we're talking about? The access is simply a, a mulch path with some stairs as shown on this plan. And then once you're into the area, it's really just a matter of walking through the area. This easement gets you to the edge of the uh, natural open space area on lot mm -hmm. 13. And then it goes across the back of the lots, I believe, is that Starling? It's the back of the lots on Starling yep. um, that are the natural open space. Uh, and there's, a, there's an obvious um, berm there and it will also be signage to uh, 
demarcate the developed parts versus the uh, natural open space area. Will it be just signage or will there be some sort of living fence or something? How, how will people know the boundaries of this area? It's just going to be signage. That's what was approved as part of the restoration plan. I see. Okay, so um, on the hydrology front, I heard the comment about the dieback that happened to the current hydrology. I'm curious to learn a little bit more about the extent of the dieback and how that will change due to the new hydrology. Well, that's really regarding the restoration area that has nothing to do with this project. Okay. What happened is... Um, when we were removing the fill and there was substantial fill in the restoration area, um, we excavated down to what was believed to the, be the original soil surface. And um, there's some seepage um, coming out of the slope below the vernal pool that uh, has short-term uh, flooding in the upper part of the upland area. And we planted that area as uplands and we've adjusted that to bring it more into a facultative, a little bit of a wetland scenario with regard to the seeding and the additional saplings that were put in. Mm. We're just trying to, you know, it's, you made your bet. I made my best guess based upon what things were before the um, fill was placed in there. Mm. And when we were taking the material out, um, you know, there was, Ten, tens of feet of fill and basically um the uh, material compacted the the subsoil and the soil underneath it we went down to the original soil and that might have been compressed or a little bit lower in grade than original it's mm -hmm. going to rebound through time we didn't put any additional soil in there we simply went down to the original topsoil and um these kinds of things that you, you set them on a trajectory and you allow them to develop naturally. What we're doing is we're just tweaking the area as it goes along with regard to pulling out anything that's aggressive or invasive. And we had a number of oak saplings um, die because that area was wetter than anticipated. So we put some red maples in there and we put some additional oaks further away from that small ponding area to try to uh, get get some coverage in there in terms of uh, woody vegetation, rather than planting a whole bunch more um, shrubs, which were being do over dominated by the herbaceous material that was there. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get the thing to a state where it will take care of itself. And without invasive species. Without, we've basically pulled anything in there that is invasive and quite honest we actually pulled um beggar ticks out of there because it's just a very aggressive species and we've actually in the vernal pool itself when we started it was a it was a monoculture of cattails growing on top of the wood chip fill in the vernal pool I see. now it's if you look at the pictures in the reports it's a nice uh grasses sedges rushes with very limited cattail pockets and very limited beggar ticks in the vernal pool. It's it's doing really well, and it has a shrub border with some saplings. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. We just have to push it and tweak it a little bit. We have one more year worth of monitoring on this one, and it's doing very well. That's good to hear. Uh, thank you. Just one more quick question on the easement. Um, is the easement perpetual? Do you know? I don't. I don't know whether it is or whether it's thirty years. Would have to look into that. Okay, we can get that That's information. That's all the questions I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So it's, it sounds like we have a couple of questions uh, about clarifying the access and easement language. Um, I did want to say that there actually is restoration on this parcel. It's in the natural area, uh, but that is part of this parcel. Um, so uh, at least it shows on your on, on the Rockwood plan. Um, 
So I would still like to understand uh, when we're looking at the topography that you've provided to us, when that is from, because uh, as I say, this land has changed quite a bit and it looks to me like it's changed in the last year or two looking on Google Earth. So that may be part of my confusion about which way the land goes. Um, and uh, again, I'd, I think for a site visit, it would be helpful if you could stake the corners and stake the, the natural lands. Uh, is, there, is there anything else from anybody else that I missed? I and think, I, and uh, Chair Herbst, yes. uh, I, I think seeing um, accompanying documents, whether it's, I don't know if it would be a deed restriction, maybe not a conservation restriction for that um, natural open space area. Good, thank you. Um, and I think with that in mind, uh, any questions on that from the proponent? Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to take a a, a motion to, to for a continuation. So moved. Uh, second. Second. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. And I vote aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Herbs. Okay, um, next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for DEP file number 0061971 and Boston file number 2023-061 from VHB on behalf of Paradigm Properties for the proposed renovation of an existing office building for life science and office use located at 56 Roland Street in Charlestown. The uh, resource area is land subject to coastal storm flowage. Who's here on behalf of the uh, applicant? Hi, I'm, I'm Howard Clark with Paradigm Properties. I'm, I'm also on this call are other team members. Um, I'll do a very, very brief introduction. Do we have visuals that we can put up yeah. there? There we go. Here yeah, go. The, we've got um, on this call is VHB uh, and their engineering team will be talking to the specifics. Uh, I have another um, uh, friend of mine from Paradigm on the call as well as somebody from Boston Environmental. We're, we're here so that we can best answer your questions. We think this is a pretty straightforward project. We're coming down the alley that's sort of lightly highlighted at the bottom of this image uh, from a manhole in the middle of Roland Street with a new electrical service, Eversource is doing this. Um, and uh, so we're going to follow with the technicals on that. But we've been in this alley several times before over the years. We're very familiar with the dirt and the conditions. It's entirely a paved area already. Um, it feels like it's very straightforward. So we just want to make sure we can get you what you need to, to make sure your questions are answered. So with that, if we can turn yeah, it over Howard, to just Ms. Ms. Wong. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, our quick question for you. Thank you. Um, the um, the utility is that a clean corridor or is there an AUL on that? Do you have do you have soils that you can? There is about? an a, there is an a there is an existing AUL, and this is why Boston Environmental is on the call as well, so we can address the nature of that. So work is monitored by LSP, probably. Okay, correct. That's that was my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Who's next? Ms. Wong. Hello, commissioners. Um, my name is Jawi Wong. I am the rental consultant with VHB. Um, for today's presentation, we will provide a brief project overview and we'll look at the existing conditions and wetland resource areas on site. And then we'll introduce the proposed work and mitigation measures. Um, and next, we'll discuss how this project meets the applicable regulations and the climate resiliency goals. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a project located at 56 Rowland Street in Boston, as you see from the aerial figure on the right side of this slide. Uh, this project includes the interior building renovation and exterior improvements. Um, so for the exterior construction, the applicant is proposing to complete base building utility and mechanical improvements. Portions of the project site are located in the land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, errors that will be disturbed from the project have been minimized during the design phase and temporary impacts will be restored to their or original conditions. 
um, and erosion and sedimentation control program will be implemented during the construction phase. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see in the figure on the right, the property is bisected by the Boston-Somerville muni municipal line. One portion is located in Boston and the another portion is in the city of Somerville. Um, the Somerville portion is currently governed by the city of Boston. Um, the project site in Boston is around 1.84 um, acres and contains 97% impervious cover, which includes the existing building outside, sidewalks, and parking areas. The site is general, generally flat. Um, the ground elevation varies from around 7 to 10 feet net 88. Um, in terms of the wetland resource areas on site, um, according to the flood insurance rate map produced by FEMA, the project site within Boston is entirely within the 1% annual transport plan, uh, which is in a zone AE with a base uh, with a base flood elevation at 10 feet net 88. Uh, which is about 16.5 feet um, Boston city base, except that there's no other resource area of site. Next slide, please. The construction work is anticipated to begin in May um, and complete in September next year in 2024. Um, on the right side of the slide, we can see a corner of the exist existing building on the top left of this figure. Um, the rest are the proposed exterior improvements. Um, so the applicant is proposing to construct a new electrical transformer and switch gear, which will be elevated by a concrete pad. Um, also, a new concrete encased electric duct bank will be extended from the new equipment to um, the Rowland Street. Um, and there's also one 60 linear feet drainage pipe will be replaced to facilitate the installation of the new electrical equipment and the concrete pad. Um, in addition, um, two new sets of stairs and guardrails will also be constructed. The project site um, will result in both permanent and temporary impacts to land subject to coastal stone foliage. Um, permanent, permanent impact is about 1,085 square feet. Um, this includes the fill, which is the concrete pad um, that is required to elevate the new electrical equipment out of the flood plan. Um, temporary impact due to the utility changing will be around 1,089 square feet. Um, however, once the construction is complete, the finished grade will be restored to the original condition. Next slide, please. Um, this project will have erosion and sedimentation control barriers and construction fencing along the limit of work. Um, we will provide catch basin inlet protection and routine cleaning and dewatering filter bags if needed. Pavement sweeping will be also used during the construction. Um, in addition, we'll also provide soil prevention equipment and training for the operators. Um, a post-construction stormwater operation and maintenance plan will also be provided. Um, since there's no change to the existing stormwater management system, the existing stormwater flow patterns and discharge locations will be maintained. Um, and during the construction phase, we'll also have stabilized vehicular access station with uh, wheel washes. Next slide, please. Um, as introduced earlier, a portion of the site is in the land subject to coastal storm foliage. Currently, there is no performance standards under the Wellands Protection Act. Um, while the project will meet the performance standards for the redevelopment re projects in land subject to coastal storm foliage under the um, Boston Wellands Regulations. Um, according to BPDA's sea level rise flood mapping tool, with a potential of 40 inches of sea level rise by 2070, a portion of the project site would be subject to um, flooding during the 1% annual chance flood event um, at elevation 19 feet Boston city base. Um, so the applicant is proposing to install the concrete pad to raise the new electrical transformers to this elevation, uh, which will safeguard the um, new, new electrical infrastructure for a long-term adaptation to more frequent storms and flooding. Um, and the concrete pad is relatively small, so it is not anticipated that will be any adverse impacts to flood control um, or adjacent properties. Um, for the stormwater management, 
the existing stormwater management system currently functions effectively um, and will be maintained during and after the construction. Um, currently, there's no change um, to that except the replace of a drainage pipe. Next slide, please. Um, the site's climate vulnerability is evaluated based on various reports and guidance, and the project will be consi consistent with the climate, re climate resiliency goals. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> climate Ready Charlestown proposes to elevate the main street in the redesign of Sullivan Square to protect the residents from sea level rise and storm surge. Um, by doing that, the main floodway will be blocked and the site will be out of the land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, since the project site is not located within the area where the um, flood protection measures are proposed, um, so it will not inhibit the ability to enact that solution. Um, the project will also comply with any applicable standards of Article 28. 25A uh, by elevating the new electrical equipment. Um, next slide, please. Um, the applicant had reviewed the draft special conditions and had submitted that. Um, next slide, please. Um, thank you for listening. This is our presentation. Uh, we welcome all of the questions that you have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, two quick questions uh, for me. Uh, on climate resilience, um, it was my understanding Main Street was going to be elevated by three feet. Uh, you've obviously looked at this more recently than I have. Um, has that been changed to two feet? Climate um, ready I, che I checked the phase one and phase two report. Um, it says two feet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Um, as far as complying with Article 25A, um, uh, did you do that because the BPDA requested it? Did you have um, a project review with the BPDA and they suggested that uh, they'd like you to go through uh, to comply with Article 25A? On uh, Lisa, I don't yeah, know. That might be a question for Howard or someone else. Yeah, we did not go through BPDA review. Um, currently, like the on, if you look on the BPDA climate resiliency website, their sea level rise uh, base flood elevation is 19 feet BCB, which is what we're meeting. It's just like what we're happy to be meeting with oh, our current design. Okay, good. So you're doing it of your own accord. That's fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it for me. Elena, did you have anything on this? I don't have anything on this. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Yeah, you mentioned you're replacing the storm drain pipe. Are there catch basins in that particular parking area? And are they, do they have sumps? Uh, there are two catch basins in that area. From the survey, we don't know if they have existing sumps. Um, we can look into, into it. Yeah. Into I mean, verifying if they have it or not. Yeah, um, because they, they would need to be uh, upgraded and improved. It, you know, you say the stormwater functions well, and, and that, that could be if it's just drained, if it just drop inlets into the system. We would need to make sure that you capture any solids that might be getting to the basins. So you could look at, you know, in traps to make sure we keep the solids there. Yeah, we can review in the field to see if they currently exist or not. Yeah, so your site says it could do it just as quickly. Yeah. We can, That's, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. And you're replacing that because the uh, the construction of the electrical will disturb uh, it? Yeah, so in order to install, so like the, the concrete pad has um, a footing and yeah. we need to kind of remove the pipe so we can install the footing and then install right. the pipe again. Right. All right. So, yeah, that's all I had. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Long? Uh, no questions for me. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Connor? Who governs the Somerville portion of the lot? Um, the city of Boston. And city there is a, yeah, there is a agreement. 
there is an agreement. Okay. Um, does that mean that comes under our jurisdiction as well, Chair Parker? Mm, no. No. I would say no. That would be my off the cuff answer um, with the caveat that I would check, but um, I think that uh, respecting municipal boundaries, despite um, despite any side agreements between parties, it still would not come under our jurisdiction. Though the parties could voluntarily do that. Right, right. Okay, thank you. And what's the nature of the temporary inf impact of the permeable space? I, I just didn't hear that properly either. The impact to uh, LSTSF, there was a permanent impact and temporary impact. I just didn't hear the temporary impact part. I, yeah, I heard the utility trenching, but I didn't hear the second part. Yeah, the temporary impact will come from uh, because of the excavation. Um, so the utility changing will cause some temporary impacts and will restore that uh, once the construction is done. So it's just for the utility trenching? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to clarify, we're not impacting imper uh, pervious areas, it's just impervious. You're impacting impervious areas, you said. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. And um, I, I also heard that it's um, it's currently the storm management is functioning effect. Stormwater management is functioning effectively currently. What does that mean? Um, there are currently no flooding issues. There are no ponding issues. Um, it's right an now, opera. Right? Yeah, it's yeah, an it's operable. Operating. It's it's an operable alley that supports the back of the building with for deliveries and <clears throat> truck access and uh, small truck access for loading and unloading of things and we can't we can't afford to have our the back door of the building flooded we would right know so in other words it's problem. draining properly and there's never any stagnation that's correct okay. yeah i ask because i, I wonder if you know if these are the opportunities to make it even more effective. We would know that if we, if we know how effectively it's working as opposed to it's just working effectively. And the last question, the construction or the elevation of the main street will take this property out of LSCSF. Is that like, is that an automatic thing or is that, does that involve a process? Um, so once the uh, um, so the flooding direction is coming from the main street direction. So once that um, area is elevated, so the flood the flooding uh, the flood water will not come through the project site. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah Commissioner Conan. I, 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 yes. In other words, this is this is my neighborhood, so um, I know a little bit about this uh, with the. Um, in conjunction with the um, Ryan Playground improvements, um, that's the plan. Uh, Ryan Playground will become like a living seashore. Resiliency measures um, will be, um, resiliency measures are planned there. And then in conjunction with raising Main Street and also the Schraff Center, um, also becoming a living, living seashore, that is going to uh, take these areas out of the uh, flood zone. So it's a little bit more than raising Main Street. It's it's somewhat comprehensive. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. That's all, Chair Parker. Great. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Herbst. No questions. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you had some um, comments to the uh, draft order conditions. I'm looking in the drive here. I don't see any markups. Are they, Elena? Um, have you gone back and forth with the uh, applicant? Yes, so we'd, we'd gotten one round and um, and then I'd sent back an edited version, um, which incorporated some, but not all of the changes, which um, that latest version is the one that's in the drive folder at the moment. Okay, okay. Um, so I'd ask the uh, applicant team, are you fine with um, the version that we have right now, this iteration? Because the reason I ask is um, if you are, um, I will call for a motion to issue the order conditions, close the hearing. If you're not, 
um, you have the option of um, working with Elena and staff over the next two weeks um, on the um, order conditions. And then uh, assuming you come to an agreement on them, we could issue the order conditions at that time, continuing the hearing tonight. No, we're we're fine with the order of conditions, the draft that you have. Okay, thank you. Okay, Elena, uh, anybody Good from Parker. the public? Yeah, Parker, Mr. Sullivan. Could we, add, could we yeah. add a, a, something on the order of conditions that they will check the uh, the catch basins and confirm that they are have a sump and a trap? Okay. Just with okay. staff, just directly with staff. Because if they don't have them, um, I would like to see that added, that they would put the right type of basins in. Okay, absolutely. Um, so confirm sumps and what? Sumps, oh, a, a sump and a hood. Hood, it's, it's, yeah. I missed that, okay, absolutely. Um, okay, Elena, so, anybody from the uh, public? I'm, I'm sorry, John, would that be something that we coordinate with BWSC directly? You can coordinate with us and you can coordinate with the, um, uh, Elena, uh, we, we can, we talk all the time. It shouldn't take you long. You can do that in a couple of days. Give me a call. Just confirm that you have it, that you've got a four foot sump and you've got a hood. It, um, and that will satisfy that condition. You're going to send a, a letter into uh, the CONCON saying you confirmed it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And in the absence of the sump and the hood that you had installed them. Mm -hmm. Is that all right, Howard? Yes, it is. It's all, it's all right. We just add it to the order of conditions. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody from the public. Elena, any emails, any tweets? And, uh, no, not that I can see. Okay. Thank you. So with that, I would um, uh, entertain a motion to issue the order of conditions with the special condition that uh, the applicant check the um, catch basins on site, confirm that there is a sump uh, and hood or hoods, and if not, that they will install a sump and hoods for the catch basins and close the hearing. So moved. We have a second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Herbst. Aye. And I vote aye, that carries five nothing. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number 0061973 and Boston file number 2023-063 from Fort Point Associates on behalf of the Esplanade Association for the proposed construction of a new welcoming destination located at 280 Charles Street in the West End of Boston. Uh, resource areas, 25-foot riverfront, waterfront area, and 100-foot buffer to bank. Um, who's here on behalf of the applicant? Good evening, Chair Parker. My name is Katie Moniz, and I'm the director of Fort Point Associates. Uh, I'm here tonight with a comprehensive team on behalf of the Esplanade Association. Uh, next Fantastic. slide. Uh, so in the interest of time, you are just going to hear from me as well as my colleague, Katie Moore, a senior planner at FPA and Bill Mayer of uh, Niche Engineering, who is our civil engineer. But again, our full team is here today and looking forward to responding to questions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the goal of this project in particular, the Charles Bank Landing on the Esplanade project is really to activate two acres of dormant land along the Esplanade that are the site of the former Lee Pool complex uh, and introducing a year round all weather space that is a benefit to visitors to the Esplanade um, as well as really an opportunity here to create and transform this space. Next slide, please. The Charles Bank Landing is located along the Charles River. It's across Storrow Drive from the Mass General Campus. Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, again, along the Charles River, it's directly across the road from the Mass General Hospital campus, and it's just west of the Massachusetts State Police Barracks, as well as the Longfellow Bridge and Museum of Science. Next slide, please. As I noted, this site uh, previously hosted DCR's Lee Pool Complex, and so the majority of our project area previously has been disturbed. Following demolition, this area was restabilized uh, with a standard grass lawn installation awaiting this project. 
And this project really has been a multi-year effort by the Esplanade Association and DCR to realize a vision for this site. Um, and they took a significant amount of public feedback that really shaped the project and also got Article 97 legislation in which to guide their use of this particular site. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick look here at our site plan. So our building is a two-story building. It's just over 12,000 square feet. It creates an opportunity for classrooms, community space, uh, public restrooms, which are needed at the Esplanade, a small cafe, um, and the offices of the Esplanade Association itself so that they can have a presence directly here on the Esplanade, which is their sole mission as a nonprofit to really promote the use activity and the ongoing maintenance that's required to keep this public space healthy. Uh, to that end, there's an enclosed uh, maintenance workyard that's just shown here towards the left of your screen. And that area will be for the storage of their equipment and horticulture supplies that they use when they bring volunteers out here to clean up the esplanade, to do plantings and to otherwise enhance this open space. As part of the project, there will be a uh, created lawn where there's an opportunity for programming and music along the Esplanade, green infrastructure in the form of a rain garden that you can see directly adjacent to uh, the pathway uh, that is most uh, well known here along the Esplanade, that great connection along the seawall uh, that brings you past the Teddy Ebersol fields and back towards the remainder of the Esplanade. Uh, there will also be multi-purpose fields uh, here, which are courts that have been created for the opportunity to play basketball, tennis, or pickleball. And that's a recreational use that has not been available in other portions of the Esplanade and is certainly needed uh, for the many youth and adult activities and recreation that happens out here at the Esplanade. In addition to this, we're going to talk about our comprehensive, both structural and natural stormwater management approach. That's what Bill will do here shortly. Uh, but next up, Katie Moore talking about our uh, wetland impacts and buffer zones. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. So the jurisdictional uh, resource areas and associated buffer zones are shown here. Uh, starting from the water's edge and working landward, the project site has uh, a little under 300 linear feet of bank, which includes the uh, the granite block seawall that Katie mentioned and a little bit of vegetated bank. In terms of impacts, the proposed work will not have any temporary or permanent impacts on this bank. Uh, next up would be the resource area, uh, the riverfront area, which is approximately 8,000 square feet of concrete pavement currently. Uh, project work includes removal of the existing pavement and repaving the pedestrian pathway, uh, as well as installation of pedestrian amenities like lighting and benches. There would be about 4,700 square feet of temporary impacts, uh, but no permanent impacts in this area. Next up, the, uh, the waterfront area is about 6,300 square feet and currently includes concrete pavement and um, a little bit of the uh, currently grassy open space. Project work in that area includes uh, graining, excuse me, grading, drainage installation, construction of the, uh, the rain garden, landscaping, and installation of the pedestrian pathway, or I should say reinstallation of the pedestrian pathway. Uh, there would be about 1,700 square feet of temporary impacts and just under 3,800 square feet of permanent impacts there. And then finally, the 100 foot buffer zone to bank. Um, it's a little bit less than 19,000 square feet in area and also currently includes the concrete pavement and portion of the grassy area. And the project work within that area, within the, the buffer, is largely similar to the waterfront area in that it's grading, drainage, insulation, uh, constructing the rain garden, landscaping, and the uh, pedestrian pathways. There'll be about 1,200 square feet of temporary impacts and just about 2,000 square feet of uh, permanent impacts in that area. Uh, next slide, please. And here I'd like to turn to Bill Meyer to uh, discuss construction period sedimentation controls. Well, thank you, Katie. Um, if the board does not mind, I apologize. I am not feeling well, so I'd rather not um, show myself. But um, you know, I will describe as uh, you know best I uh, you know can here, um, you know, for this project. Yeah, so, that's fine. So, Hope you feel better, and thank you for making it. Um, 
what you see before you is our sedimentation control uh, you know, plan. Um, you know, much of the area, as you see, is outlined with a temporary construction fence. And we have a double row of um, erosion control devices, not only in our um, surrounded uh, you know, boundary there for our project site, but also um, close to the uh, you know, Charles River on the other side of the existing walkway where we are um, proposing another um, barrier, um, double barrier of um, line defense, if anything should um, stray away from, from the project site, which we don't anticipate um, you know, happening. Um, you know, we also are um, you know, proposing to install um, silt sacks um, in proposed catch basins and existing catch basins. Um, you know, on the site there, um, it's all a matter of how the contractor um, you know, performs his work. Okay, um, next slide. And on this um, you know, slide, this is our uh, utility design for the, for the project. We've got a double system of, um, well, I'll start with drainage. We have a double system of um, infiltration um, chambers they can see just about in the middle of your screen that are interconnected with two 12 inch pipes. Um, and we are collecting uh, runoff from the, the site and the buildings. Uh, you know, from the buildings, it's being handled by, um, with some rainwater harvesting um, you know, tanks, about 3,400 gallons for, for each or so, um, you know, for reuse on the site for landscaping and, and so forth. We do have a, um, Basins or basin to the north of the site, um, north of the existing or the proposed building. I'm sorry, I'm just a little um, confused um, as I'm speaking. Um, between the building, the proposed building, and the Charles River, um, you know, wall area there. Um, you know, our intent is to, um, you know, have the structural and non-structural um, devices. Um, you know, for the site here, you know, to collect stormwater, treat it, and then discharge it out to the um, Charles River. And um, some of the other work that we have proposed are um, sewer line connection from each of the buildings will connect to an existing sewer manhole located uh, near the, the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the, of the project site. Um, and we're proposing um, as you can see on the left-hand side, uh, treatment trains for 90 and 98% of um, treatment for TSS removal. And the minimum requirement for phosphorus removal is 64%. Um, right now we are at uh, 65% um, phosphorus removal. Um, um, Bill, can I ask you a question? Is, it, is there a TMDL here? Yeah, yes, for the Charles River, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, and you know, for the for the systems, um, you know, what we do have are um, you know, the subsurface infiltration systems. The the two um, systems in the middle of the page, as you see, we've got a water quality structure, um, you know, unit. We're using um, area drains, uh, you know, with uh, sumps and hoods, you know, over them. Um, we, as I mentioned, we've got the rainwater harvesting, uh, you know, tanks to collect runoff directly from the uh, building roofs, um, which will then have an overflow into the uh, storm chamber systems. Um, you know, we do have the, the rain garden um, on the north side, as I, you know, had mentioned, water quality swale up on the, the westerly side of the uh, site, just north of that um left-sided um, infiltration system chamber. Thank you, Bill. And uh, just to wrap up here, um, the project also includes a number of other sustainable initiatives that we're happy to discuss uh, if the commission is interested, including an all electric building design, uh, being LEED gold certifiable, an on-site PV solar array, uh, in addition to significant shade tree planting, and other water conservation measures as Bill explained them. So with that, we'd love to pass it back to the commission and take any questions that you might have. 
Great, thank you. When are we going to be able to enjoy this area? How long is construction going to be? Um, well, we're not we're not making any promises now, but the goal would be to see if we could break ground at some point in 2024 so that this vision could be realized uh, sooner rather than later. But uh, we continue to do the hard work of permitting um, and uh, getting this set up. But we appreciate your enthusiasm. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay. Um, and who is, I see that the pedestrian walkway will revert back to control of DCR. What's the uh, arrangement here between uh, the EA and DCR? Um, sure. So as a uh... Part of ongoing negotiations for a ground lease, the Esplanade Association would manage a portion of the site that's bound by the lease area. Um, and that uh, fundamentally is close to the area that you saw outlined in our plans. Um, as you noted for those portions of the walkway, obviously the existing parking lot that's out there today that, that belongs to DCR that includes accessible parking and loading uh, would revert to DCR, but it's Esplanade Association's uh, goal here to be conducting the maintenance and the ongoing responsibilities within their project lease area. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, uh, Elena, what do you have on this? I think that covered really oh. my, my only question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, did you want to... Sure. Maybe we should maybe we should deal with this now. Oh, sorry. Just for, just uh, just the just order of conditions. Day. Anything about the order conditions? Are they ready tonight or what's going on there? So we'd gone back and forth on those um, a few times and we were um, still sort of sorting out a few of the items that I think have um, been sort of a question mark between uh, the commission and DCR in the past as well. Um, so Katie, I don't know if you'd had a chance. I know that we'd um, touched base on that fairly like a little bit later in the uh, in the work day today. So I don't know if you had a chance to look over the revised version um, of the conditions that I'd sent over. We do, and we really appreciate Elena's coordination on this. So uh, it is uniquely challenging because from the Esplanade Association's perspective, while they are the uh, maintainer of their set boundary, they're certainly happy with the standard conditions as we discuss them. Um, again, there are some things related to the ground lease that uh, could allow this uh, at some much later date in the future to revert to a DCR asset. Uh, and DCR does have a few concerns about some of the perpetual conditions. Uh, as Ellen no noted, that has uh, come up before, I think, in negotiations with uh, the Conservation Commission. So at this time, it, it sounds like the city is planning on meeting with DCR to discuss this, and we would be happy uh, to reappear uh, in two weeks, if that's the will of the commission, in order to work under that uh, modified order of conditions that DCR and Boston Concom can agree upon. Okay, okay. And Elena, to be clear, it's the um, perpetual maintenance conditions that that are that are the sticking point here. That was, I would say, that was probably the the major one, right, Katie? It was. Uh, there are stormwater and snow management initiatives throughout the Esplanade and throughout DCRs that uh, don't completely align with the standard conditions as written, and I believe those are the items that will really need to be discussed so that it's clear whose responsibility each is. Okay. Yeah, the snow, the snow management, um, we have come to resolution with DCR uh, to the extent that they're doing snow management. Um, they supply us with their global snow management um, program. For that area, if there's one in the district, fine. If it's statewide, that's fine. But I think um, I, I can't remember if it's just district or statewide. But um, I, it sounds to me like it's the perpetual maintenance um, obligations that we're going to be talking about, or will be talked about at the meeting. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, a real quick one. I think it's probably for Bill. Um, is the volume of water that you can hold in all those uh, underground chambers in the rain garden equivalent to one inch? I'm happy to answer for Bill, who oh. might be coming off mute here. The okay. answer is yes. Is it inch and a half or is it just one inch? I just see your numbers come in perfectly. You got all the technical numbers. Oh. Generally, people just say on the impervious area, we're holding an inch. And I'm just curious. Didn't no, show up that. Uh, no, uh, you know, John, we, we do comply with the, with the one inch standard. And yeah. we also go up to the 100 year storm events. Okay, that's that's all. I just normally it's written on the plan, and it wasn't. So 
I'm just there, curious. There, there was a there was a requirement in the uh, no, MEPA um, a couple yep. of months ago when we did you know talk with them, and um, I assure them that we are holding back up to the hundred year storm event for this project. That's fine. And where you connect the sewers, um, that's a private DCR sewer system that you're connecting to. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. All right. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Yes. Thank you for the presentation, Katie and Bill. Uh, seems like a really great project. I saw the um, six proposed tree removals and just wanted to note for uh, you know folks who are on the call in the hearing tonight, the net caliper increase of trees that's being proposed as well. Correct. So correct. And, just uh, wanted we do have our talented landscape architecture team on here. I'm sure Jesse will do a much better job than I will, but uh, they did go out and substantially evaluate these trees, which we included in our filing to understand their health and their appropriateness to being, uh, you know, functional parts of the ecosystem here at the Esplanade. And so the goal here was to limit the removals to trees that were failing in health, um, as well as one tree, which is a non-native tree, which we are planning on replacing with increased caliper, as you know. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I think where where I sort of became really especially interested in the project was this rain garden, which is sort of synonymous with the bio retention basin, right? Yes. Um, so I know that you have an operation and maintenance plan relating to that. And um, I'm what is the basin, the bio retention basin going to be open to um, people enjoying the park or foot traffic? Uh, it will. There will be no restrictions. It uh, is a real feature of the building, and the building really reacts to that natural space as well as a natural play area that's directly adjacent to it. Jesse, if you don't mind terribly, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind just to hop on it and describe our rain garden a little bit. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so the rain garden, um, as you saw in the plan, it, 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 it's very lush. Uh, we're, we're using a mix of native trees, shrubs, and ground covers. Uh, predominantly, the trees will be on the um, crown of the slope, not in the basin itself. Um, and they're a mix of Nissa sylvatica, common name black tupelo. Uh, there will be some gray birches, Betula populifolia on the shoulders as well, and then Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak. Um, Mixed underneath those trees and, and kind of more in the mid slope will be a mix of native shrubs, Clethra ulnifolia, common name summer sweet, Ilex verticillata, common name winterberry, Itea virginica, common name Virginia sweet spire, and Sambucus canadensis, common name elderberry. All great pollinators have uh, great berries for, for birds. Um, and then the ground cover, which will be Tove slope and at the bottom of the basin, is a mix of uh, sedges. Carex citrina, common name fringe sedge. Carex pennsylvanica, which is like a little more dry, will be on mid slope, Pennsylvania, sand, Pennsylvania sedge. Carex vulpinoide, common name box sedge. And then a mix of asters, Joe pieweed, and then sensitive fern. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I know, that, I mean, tons of great native plants in there. And uh, it looks like the O and M plan kind of, you know, spells out how things might be corrected with this green stormwater infrastructure if it's not, you know, forming as the BMP has intended, right? Um, I guess one thing, and I, I, I hate to mention this, but the idea, Itea virginica, the Virginia sweet spire, that isn't a native. So I wonder if there's a, maybe a native alternative that might be considered from- um, Yes, folks. totally. We can, we'll jump right on that. Cool, okay. Um, that's really it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Conan. Thank you, Chair Parker. With vegetation moving northward in the Northern Hemisphere, I wonder if we should sort of revisit the idea of native vegetation to include what's immediately south of us. So we prepare for the warming a little bit, try to get ahead of it. Um, the green infrastructure portions of this project are very um, exciting to see. Will there be signage to explain what exactly is going on underground? 
I think we would love to have uh, that opportunity. I think one of the things that we've been discussing uh, both with DEP Waterways and with the Esplanade Association is how educational signage can be a real component of this project. Um, and I think to your point, green infrastructure would be a wonderful focal point. Great, thank you. So what was the nature of the previous use? I know, I know you said DCR and there was some use. I'm asking just to understand what condition the soil is left in. Sure, so it was a structure uh, that supported a recreational pool use. And so uh, for many years, lots of children uh, from greater Boston learned to swim here at the Leap Pool Complex. I see. So you're not concerned about any kind of toxic substance in the soil? Uh, we do have an LSD on this project who is managing uh, two areas that have been documented and, and very clearly defined as AULs based on uh, some legacy contamination that's associated with demolition and urbanized soils here. So McPhail will be uh, guiding the Esplanade Association and their contractor and the work will be conducted in accordance with the mass contingency plan. So uh, I think it is a great note because you do have to certainly think about the urbanization of soils in many of these locations. Does that mean remediation will be part of the work? Um, it, uh, from what I have heard, and again, this is early in that stage of the process with Mass DEP, but that these areas are stable where they are buried in place and that the goal is to not disturb them uh, and to conduct the work as well as the infiltration outside of these boundaries. I see, okay. So with the Esplanade Association getting space here, some of this may be still in negotiation, but just for my understanding, the, the lease period hasn't begun already, right? It has not. There is not an executed not. ground lease at this time. Okay. So currently it's DCR on property. And, Correct. Yeah. And there's no lease on this. And uh, what is the lease period? Uh, so Ali, I might have to ask you to answer this, but I believe the answer is ultimately around 30 years uh, with an option to extend. Yes, I thank see. you. That's correct. 30 years with an option for a 10 year extension. I see. Thank you. And do I understand the topography here correctly that it slopes from sort of the middle of the property in all directions, including towards Storo Drive? Uh, the existing site as it is set right now um, actually has the site uh, actually depressed a little bit post uh, demolition of the Leap Pool complex. So the lowest points are towards the center of the existing site. Um, oh, in a proposed condition, uh, you are correct. It's generally pretty flat out there and you'll see that we have uh, some small swales and some other capture opportunities as well as a number of area drains in which to be able to collect runoff. Great. Thank you. That's all, Chair Parker. Great, thank you. Commissioner Herbst? No questions, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I am, um, well, Elena, I don't see any hands up. Did we get any um, emails or tweets? We did not. Nope, all set. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so it looks oh, like we're going to have to continue to um, um, work out the um, order of conditions. So that's that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, I know that there's a meeting coming up on Friday, so hopefully that that can be resolved. Um, Ali, just want to uh, congratulate you. This is this is an amazing project and quite a uh, quite a step for the Esplanade Association. You've done great work over the years, and uh, this is this is really exciting. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion to continue the hearing. So moved. We have a second. Second. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five nothing. Okay. Hopefully, we get the order of conditions um, hashed out um, by next time. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time and have a wonderful evening. Of course. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Next item on the agenda is a request for a determination of applicability from um, Thailand International on behalf of the Massachusetts Port Authority for the proposed improvements to the existing utilities and pavements to prepare for the relocation of a compressed natural gas station from Logan Airport located at 45 um, Tomahawk Drive, uh, East Boston, Mass. Um, who's here on behalf of the applicant? Yes, thanks, uh, uh, Parker. Uh, 
and, uh, members of the commission. I'm Chris Bush, uh, senior environmental planner with uh, Massport. I hear this evening with other Massport staff members, including uh, assistant director Peter De Bruin, our project manager uh, Stephen Fletcher, and staff from our uh, consultant T. Y. Lynn. Um, the RDA before you this evening is for the relocation of a compressed natural gas station, a portion of which is within uh, jurisdiction. Um, I'll hand it off now to uh, TJ Labor um, of our consultant team to discuss the scope of the project as well as the work proposed uh, within uh, resource area and project schedule. TJ? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, next slide. If uh, yeah. So TJ Labor, senior engineer from TY Lynn on behalf of uh, Master Support Authority, like Chris said, um, you can go to the, the first slide. Uh, we have a short presentation. So currently, uh, there's an existing compressed natural gas station located in the northwest corner of Logan Airport that is just outside of the airport's operating area. Um, the CNG facility is owned and operated by Clean Energy Fuels. Um, future airside improvements in this area of the airport is going to displace this CNG facility and require its relocation. Um, so this relocated CNG station will be used primarily by Massport, um, but will also be open to the general public. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this project is located next to the Noria gas station between Transportation Way, Jeffrey Street, and Tomahawk Drive. Um, prior to 2014, the site was used as a rental car and maintenance facility. Uh, the superstructures on the site were removed, but the foundations are still in place. Um, the site is still currently owned by Massport and is mostly used as an overflow car and bus parking lot um, with a portion of it that's sometimes used temporarily for construction staging and other ongoing Massport projects uh, in and around the airport. Um, next slide, please. And this project is pretty straightforward, at least from an environmental impact perspective. You can see where the buffer zone crosses our site. Um, the south side is primarily um, mill and inlay, where we have full depth asphalt pavement on the north side, which is outside of the buffer zone, I mean, outside of the impact zone. Um, so the southwestern portion of the project site falls within the LC, uh, CSF, and uh, work to be completed in this area is only milling and inlay and some utility trenching um, and a very small area of full, full depth pavement reconstruction. Um, these temporary impacts to the area is around 9,000 square feet during construction. Um, the work within the flood zone will have no permanent floodplain impacts from grade changes. Our goal is to maintain all the existing grades and really the, the reason for the reconstruction is the pavements are just in real poor shape. So we just tried to mimic the existing site conditions that were there. Um, existing drainage paths and stormwater flow patterns will be maintained through the completion of the project and post um, construction as well. Um, so I did not put the ENS controls on the slide, but we did submit the full bid set um, for the submission uh, for review, but all these standard erosion control measures, catch basin inlet filters, fiber rolls, straw waddles will be installed. Um, and from a impervious um, calculation standpoint, there's no increase in impervious area. If anything, uh, there's a minor reduction um, in impervious area. That's a small piece of pavement that will be converted to turf at the end. Um, and that's that's pretty much it from the project um, impact standpoint. Um, the project is anticipated. Uh, we're actually looking to have an NTP uh, next week. Um, it's a multi-phase project where the first phase is uh, anticipated to go this fall slash winter. Um, clean energy fuels will come in over the winter and install their fueling islands and their equipment storage area, uh, all which will meet the sustainable and resiliency guidelines of Massport with um, elevated um, on an elevated concrete platform. Um, and then early next spring, uh, our contractor would come back and finish uh, paving operations. Um, and that's pretty much it from a engineering standpoint. Okay, thank you, TJ. Uh, Chris, anything else? No, that's that's pretty much the whole project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Elena, did you? I don't, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. 
Yeah, you showed a a, a twelve inch uh, swale. Uh, it looks like a crushed stone or rock or something outside the project limits as you defined them on that print. What is that improving? There's a there's a catch basin at the end of that on the Noria gas station side where the drainage flow that flows to that corner um, flows to the turf and then reaches that catch basin. We're just converting that turf to rep swale just to move the water to that catch basin after a couple of years the grass has kind of grown and burned up over the edge of the pavement so we're just allowing the flow to operate more efficiently so you're just re regrading um, correct the water correct. Correct. from your correct. project site to to the basin correct okay it just said it was outside the project limit so i thought that was weird well they're both they're both massport owned so it's this project right i the line does show that it's inside, but you are you are correct. Yep, not not a big deal. I just I was curious what it was made of, but got it. That's all I had. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Nothing for me, thank you. You, Commissioner Conan. Thanks, Chair Parker. Uh, really quickly, the, the CNG facility is moving from where to where? Sorry. I'm right outside Logan, uh, the North Cargo area on Cottage Street. Um, mm -hmm. It's being relocated to uh, adjacent to the Noria gas station on uh, in between Jeffries, Tomahawk, and transportation. I see. Thanks. And um, if oh, a question for you, Chris, the Massport Sustainability and Resiliency Guidelines are they just for the record more stringent or less stringent than the cities? In terms of Elevations they are they are higher than than what the city represents with the base flood elevations and design flood elevations. So um, I, Peter De Bruin is also with us this evening, uh, who's the uh, assistant director for sustainability and resilience. But yeah, those flood proofing guidelines which have, have been in place um, uh, for uh, many years now um, do set higher design flood elevations than, than what the city city does require. Peter, did you want to say anything? Uh, no, Commissioner Conan, just, uh, yeah, the, in, in terms of the, the flood proofing design guidelines, as opposed to the sustainability design standards, um, the flood proofing uh, guideline is, is quite conservative. Um, we used a 500 year storm event with uh, three feet of, uh, of freeboard uh, to create the design flood elevations, which were recently uh, reviewed and updated to accommodate the Massachusetts coastal flood risk model. However, there was only one minor adjustment to that uh, made in one specific location and not relevant to this project. The design standards themselves, we feel uh, once they're published early next year, um, are, uh, are, are, I, I can't match them up point to point to the city of Boston or, or Commonwealth standards, other than to say, you know, with a net zero goal, we're looking at um, at uh, it being as progressive as possible in, in terms of that. So point by point, I think, you know, they go a long ways towards working towards um, the net zero objective over time. Yeah, thank you, Peter and Chris. I mean, I, I just ask to learn what is more stringent so that we know we can try and apply those so that we ensure the maximum amount of safety here and resiliency and sustainability as you can understand last question will it, during this project if the flooding let's say flooding happens what's the contingency plan during think, the project yeah okay go ahead yeah during. well um during the project uh you know, there, um, equipment, if we know that there's going to be a storm like a nor'easter coming, we, you know, construction sites are typically um, uh, secured so that nothing gets impacted. And of course, we follow the order of conditions for every project, which, you know, takes into account all of the other uh, accommodations. And then as equipment is installed, in this case, as TJ mentioned earlier, the critical equipment, um, any of it that meets uh, the flood proofing design guideline requirements for critical equipment, whether it's electrical or, or pumps or, you know, life safety related is installed um, at the flood elevation, which in this case for new construction such as this would be 17 uh, feet uh, NAVD uh, uh, 88. 
So if a storm occurred during construction, you know, either equipment would be moved to protect it um, or otherwise secured. Um, typically it wouldn't be laying around in, in the event of, you know, potential flooding in that um, location. Great, thank you, Peter. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Herbst. No questions, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, Elena, anything from the public? I don't see any raised hands. Nothing from the public. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to uh, issue a negative determination of applicability with standard erosion controls. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five nothing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Next item on the agenda is request for a determination of applicability from Ty and Bond on behalf of the Boston Gas Company for the proposed replacement of an existing gas main located at 283 to 289 Walk Hill in Roslindale. Um, must be Julia. Hi, yes, it's me. Uh, okay. Good evening. Julia Novotny from Ty and Bond um, here on behalf of Boston Gas Company. Um, to discuss the project. Um, so I apologize, there are no slides for this, um, but I'll just give a brief overview. Um, Boston Gas Company is proposing to replace approximately 270 linear feet of existing um, cast iron and plastic gas main in Walk Hill Street between Canterbury Street and um, American Legion Highway. Um, so approximately 34 linear feet of this replacement is within the 100 foot buffer zone um, to an unnamed perennial stream, as well as some bordering vegetated wetlands. Um, the work is adjacent to, but not within the riverfront area and waterfront area of that stream. Um, the work is, is proposed due to existing um, encroachment from electric utilities um, in the area. Um, and so uh, the extent of work will involve um, excavation of trenches within the roadway, um, approximately two feet wide and, and three feet deep to support the pipe. Um, a replacement pipe will be installed um, in the trenches and um, the old main will be purged and uh, abandoned in place. So there won't be any um, removal of that existing pipe. Um, standard erosion controls will be used, um, particularly catch basin inserts, um, um, wherever there are catch basins adjacent to the work um, and as necessary, any other um, barriers like silt socks or um, silt fence or straw bales, any, anything like that um, as deemed necessary adjacent to the resource areas. Um, and as I mentioned, it's approximately 34 linear feet of the proposed replacement is within the 100 foot buffer zone. So that's approximately um, 68 square feet of impact from the trans trench excavation. Um, the roadway will be Re, um, return to previous um, conditions following construction. So there won't be any changes in grade um, and everything will be restored to um, pre-existing conditions. And uh, I think that's it for the initial kind of overview. Are there any initial questions? Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Elena, um, do you have anything? I don't have anything on this, thanks. Okay, Commissioner Sullivan. I noticed you did have a planned stamp by a professional engineer. It doesn't show any of the utilities in the street. That's quite unusual for the city. So there's only a gas main in that street and nobody else. Um, so I know we these plans were um, done in house by um, National Grid. I'm not sure about the extent to which they have utility information, but I know that typically the utility um, location of other utilities in the roadway are determined prior to construction, particularly by the contractor. Um, so because I think the data that they have for these plans are approximate. Um, so, you know, measures will be taken before construction to ensure that um, there aren't going to be any utilities that are um, in the way of, of the replacement gas main. And that's all I had. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Uh, no questions, just maybe want to state for the record, 
this is Canterbury Brook, not an unnamed stream. Oh, okay. Thank you. But you're welcome. That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Conan. Thanks, Chair Parker. I'll ask my usual question. Is there an um, increase in the diameter? Um, yes, there is. Um, so the existing gas main is six inches in diameter. Um, 260 linear feet of it is cast iron and 10 linear feet is um, a plastic gas main from 2007. Um, and the replacement gas main will be eight inches in diameter um, and it will be plastic and not um, cast iron. So there's increase in capacity. So um, interestingly, this was a question that came up on a previous project, I think a couple months ago. And um, after discussing with Boston Gas Company and their engineers, it appears that um, when going from metal piping to plastic piping, which is now their standard uh, material, the inner diameter of the plastic is actually, I believe it's, it's less than the capacity that would be for the same diameter of a, of a metal uh, material. So the capacity is staying the same. Um, it's just that the outer diameter has to increase to accommodate the same capacity. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. I didn't know that detail. So what's stated here is really the outer diameter then? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, so Commissioner Conan, um, we actually, I think Julia brought along a representative from um, National Grid, uh, and we asked your question for you, and that's where we, when we were educated about the uh, plastic versus the cast iron um, pipes. Um, right, thank you. Yeah, and you were not here for it, which was very disappointing yeah, I, to me. I missed that. I meant to pass that along to you, and I must have forgot. I apologize. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. That's all, Chair Parker. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Herbst? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands from the public. Elena, any other forms of uh, communication? Nope, I'm not seeing anything either. Okay, so with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to um, issue a negative determination of applicability with standard erosion controls. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That passes five nothing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Next item on the agenda is a request for a determination of applicability from TRC on behalf of John Wren for the proposed construction of a second story addition to an existing single family home located at 46 Crosstown Avenue in West Roxbury. Um, who's here on behalf of the applicant? Hi. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Molly Lennon. Um, I'm with TRC uh, representing John Wren tonight. Um, so I believe John Wren and Nicole Wren are here along with their contractor, Owen Murray from Murray and Sons Contractors. Um, so yeah, the project site is an existing single family house located at 46 Crosstown Avenue in West, West Roxbury. It's a pretty flat parcel uh, within a residential neighborhood, and there is a cemetery and woods to the south of the house. Um, the Wrens are looking to build a second story addition to their home, uh, completely within the current footprint of the house. So they won't be changing or increasing the existing footprint, just building on top of what is already there. Uh, so, Resource areas, there is a jurisdictional forested wetland to the southwest of the project site uh, located on private land. Um, I think, I think uh, there should be a, a slide showing. Um, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, the shaded blue area to the southwest of the site is the wetland, um, the approximate wetland line. Um, and there is an associated 100 foot buffer zone that extends onto the southern half of the site, um, including a, a portion of the house. Um, so the wetland edge is approximately 85 feet from the southwest corner of the house. And there's about 490 square feet of the house that lies within the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, so for the work itself, the project involves adding a second story onto the house, like I said. 
Um, and then since all of the work is taking place completely within the existing footprint of the house, there's actually no uh, temporary or permanent impacts to the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, so no heavy machinery will be used for construction and they will have a dumpster on site to contain any waste or debris and that will be kept um, outside of the 100 foot buffer zone on the northern side of the house near the street. Uh, there's also no tree removal required for this project so no vegetation within the 100 foot buffer zone will be disturbed. And again, since they're just building on top of the house, uh, the footprint of the house will not be changing and uh, therefore there will be no ground disturbance or grading associated with this project. Um, so in conclusion, although there's a portion of the project that lies within the 100 foot buffer zone, the work itself will have a de minimis impact on the buffer zone. Um, and after we consulted with uh, Boston Conservation staff, we were advised to submit this RDA to just make sure that we're adequately meeting the performance standards um, to protect the nearby wetland to the southwest of the site. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Molly. Okay, yeah. um, the only thing I have to say is uh, congratulations to the RINs. Um, that's exciting. Uh, please enjoy your new home. Um, Elena, um, what do you have on this, if anything? Uh, nothing that hasn't already been stated. I was just going to um, recommend that uh, the commission issue a negative determination of applicability, given the fact that it's not increasing the footprint um, and everything else that Molly already mentioned in the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan. Um, on the stormwater runoff, uh, is the building department going to let you add this on and not improve the stormwater runoff and therefore by requiring digging in the backyard? Do you know? Um, I am not sure of that myself. Um, yeah, I've not dealt with the building department personally, so I don't know if yeah, um, so if this had to come to be to the Boston Water of Sewer, you would be required to do it by the commission. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, since you're not touching any commission utilities, it doesn't need their approval. Mm -hmm. But the building department has been you know, working, you know, with a lot of this. I don't know what they'll do in this case, but when they have the rainfall, rather than just have it run off through the downspouts onto the land, which I assume that's what it does today, um, they generally require that the first inch of water be infiltrated. Mm -hmm. So I, I just flagged that for you that that may be an issue. And then yeah, we, it looks like Owen Murray raised his hand. Okay. Hi. Good evening. Uh, yes, uh, the building department's viewed all of this. They haven't mentioned anything about the rainwater. Um, it, it won't be any different from what the uh, there is now. It's just the only difference is the roof's going to be higher than. It currently is and right now it's only a one and a half story and, and it's, it's turning into a two and a half story home so there won't be any impact in terms of you know the length of the house or anything like that it's it's still the same amount of rainwater be still that's washing off the, the current house oh i understand it was just a question i know the city is pushing for improvements still water management everywhere and you know there's a substantial amount of money being spent they there has been they have been tagging them on, but that isn't a, a definitive. So I'm just curious what they were doing. That's fine. Great, I'm thank you. Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Long. Nothing for me. Thank you, Commissioner Conan. Nothing from me either. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Herbst. No questions. Thanks. Okay, Elena. I don't see any other raised hands. Did we get um, any other form of communication? Nope. I'm not seeing anything either, and we we didn't get anything else. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to um, issue a negative determination of applicability with the standard erosion uh, controls condition. So moved. Thank you. I have first and second there. So, Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries 5 nothing. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Great. Thank you. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a request for an extension 
for DEP file number, I assume that's an extension of the order of conditions for DEP file number 0061685 from Four Point Associates on behalf of Harbor Fuels LLC for the proposed installation of a concrete pad and above ground fuel storage tank located at 256 Marginal Street in East Boston. Resource areas are designated port area and subject to coastal storm flowage, 100 foot buffer to coastal bank. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Hi there, my name is Erica Frazier. Um, I'm here on behalf of Harbor Fuels LLC. Um, and then with me, I believe, is Marshall Greenland and Megan Black. Um, like Commissioner uh, Parker said, we are um, requesting a three-year extension on the work that was previously approved um, due to the COVID orders uh, Number 17 and uh, 42, the, um, the order of conditions expires on December 12th, 2023. Um, so the reason why we're requesting this extension is because shortly after the order was originally received in 2019, the COVID pandemic was declared and subsequently reduced the need to service and support boating operations at the shipyard. Uh, due to the decline in commuter boating, yachts, and tourist-related vessels. Um, this decreased the demand for fuel and delayed the need for the capacity at the shipyard. Uh, however, um, recently, the shipyard has observed a rise in operations, which has now increased the need for the additional fuel capacity again. Um, so in short, just the, the delay from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic required more time than the initial three-year term. Okay. Um, Elena, anything to add to that? Nothing to add, thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Nothing. Commissioner Long? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Conan? No questions. Commissioner Herbst? No questions. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any hands raised. Elena, anyone, any uh, other form of communication? No other forms. Okay. So with that, I would entertain an order to uh, extend the existing order of conditions for an additional three years for DEP file number 0061685. Please. So second. Thank you. I get a second. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I bet I, I, that carries five nothing. Okay, thank you, Erica. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Take care. Okay, there have been a number of continuances. Uh, continued our notice of intent uh, for DEP file numbers 006 and 1704 in Boston, file number 2020-007, DEP file number 0061772 in Boston file number 2021-010, DEP file number 0061961 in Boston file number 2023-051. We will now begin our regular hearing. The first item on the agenda is a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061846 from the McClellan Highway Development Company, LLC, for the creation of an interim outdoor entertainment venue, associated infrastructure, and other related site improvements to be located or located at Suffolk Downs, uh, William F. McClellan Highway in East Boston. Um, Elena, I assume you did a um, site visit. Uh, what's what's your uh, recommendation? Yes. So, um, based on the site visit, it it does look like um, all of the all of the work was completed. There are some photos for the commission's review that are included in the folder. Um, and based on that, it it seems as though all of the work was completed. I also. Um, we'll note that part of this filing um, was also a question about the LOMAR. Um, they had included in their filing a copy of the LOMAR and related appeal information. Um, and based on the updated limits of LSCSF, the outdoor entertainment venue is no longer going to be located within resource areas. Um, we also just uh, discuss this while we were on site because uh, one of the questions that I had was whether this project would have to come back to the commission um, to be permitted again as the stage is going to be uh, coming, well, the, excuse me, the stage for the entertainment venue will be coming back uh, in the spring. And um, yeah, so based on the the new limits of the 
um, of LSCSF that they're no longer going to have to permit this part of um, Suffolk Downs with the Conservation Commission. Yep, I remember the Lomar well. Um, that was brought up during the public path, um, public path discussions, probably three, four months ago, or maybe even six months ago now. Okay. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sullivan, any questions? No questions. Commissioner Long? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Connor? No questions. Commissioner Herbst? No questions. Yeah, I don't have any questions. So with that, I'd entertain a... Um, Entertain a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061846. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. That wasn't very enthusiastic. <laughs> Commissioner Sullivan. It was better than mine. Uh, yeah, aye. true. True, true. Okay. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five nothing. Okay, next one is a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061529 from Marginal Street LLC for the construction of a seven unit uh, residential building located at 298 Marginal Street, East Boston. Eleanor, what do you have on this? We conducted a site visit for this as well. Um, some photos are available in the drive for the commission's review. Um, I'll also note that the photos that we have are from the front of the building as the back side of the building is um, outside of the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. And um, they have received in the past a partial certificate of compliance for the work that was completed on the building. And now um, they're coming back for complete COC as the work that was done on the, the sidewalk um, has also been completed. And, and based on our assessment, um, everything seems to be in order. So we would recommend that the commission issue a certificate of compliance for the project. Okay, any questions from the commission for um, Elena? Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 0061529. So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Connor? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries five nothing. Okay, Elena, um, you again. Next item on the agenda, administrative updates. Great. This is uh, my big moment. I will turn my camera back on. Um, so for administrative updates, um, a few items here. Um, I, I thought if it would be helpful for the commission, um, we receive letters occasionally with um, just updates that the commission has requested in the past regarding um, either sort of annual reviews of how a particular area is doing or notification of um, work beginning. And so there are just um, two of those that I've included in the folder for the commission's review. One of them is uh, a notice of melting gas line maintenance, and the other is the notice of MWRA's um, drawdown, uh, which is over uh, the winter, excuse me, the winter drawdown of Chestnut Hill Reservoir. So those are in the drive for the commission's review. And I, I didn't really have any further notes on those, just um, there so that you can peruse. And uh, then the other item is actually something that, um, Commissioner Long is informed on as well. We conducted a site visit um, over at Blake Estates um, for, uh, let's see, conducted a site visit, I believe it was last week, um, to review the, the condition of uh, land that is under a conservation restriction over near Blake Estates. Um, it seems to not be in the best shape. There's um, there's some, some debris, some dumping. Um, and Commissioner Long, if, if there's things that you want to add as well, I know that you had uploaded photos um, as well from the and some other information about this area in the drive for the commission's review. Yeah, thanks, Elena. Um, some of the maybe the main points of interest for the commissioners might also be um, uh, trying to find a point of contact on the part of the grantor, which is Blake Estates. Um, I think also going by Beacon Properties, so they're a nonprofit, and um, so trying to establish contact with the owner of the site, who um, you know is supposed to be a really you know important stakeholder in the management of the property. If if folks have read the conservation restriction that's in the folder, they'll see 
the owner, Blake Estates or Beacon, is uh, on the hook for quite a bit of the maintenance. But um, the city may be as well in some cases if maintenance goes undone or um, if maintenance needs are reported and then aren't followed through on by the owner. So, um, you know, wanted to provide this as like a routine update. This is a, a conservation restriction, one of the few that Urban Wilds, you know, checks in on every now and then um, as the management arm of the CONCOM in some ways. And uh, yeah, if folks have reviewed the photos and have any questions, um, I'm sure Elena or I um, would be happy to answer those. Yeah, quick question. Um, I'm having a hard time. I can't um, expand or enlarge this. What's the uh, penalty for not complying with the uh, CR here? You know, I'm not. I don't see anything. I don't think there's a levy fine or anything no. like that that I can that I remember. Though I wasn't looking through that lens. I look through the the plant pruning lens. <laughs> yeah, it just it just occurs to me that occurs to me that it's difficult. Well, it's not difficult to enforce it. It feels like this might be a court action. Unfortunately, just something to think about for CRs in the future, um, that there should be some enforcement provisions, um, you know, maybe even stipulated penalties, uh, whether they be monetary or um, sort of a supplemental environmental uh, project uh, to improve conditions further if, you know, there's a violation, but I don't see anything like that in there. Okay. Okay. That's that's it for me. Commissioner Sullivan, do you have anything? No. Nope. Okay. Conan, uh, Commissioner Conan, I'm sorry. Um, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, quickly, Commissioner Long. When you say city, would, do you happen to know which department? That would be the Parks Department and working with the conservation staff and the commission to, um, if you look, if you see the open space GIS file for the city, um, pretty much all the urban wilds and the, some of the conservation restrictions, they're under CONCOM jurisdiction and ownership and then parks management. So that mm -hmm. would be uh, Paul Sutton. Okay, thank you. And did you just happen to notice this or is this, the, the reason I ask is if there is such violation, are we just discovering them by happenstance or do we have a process i don't well Ellen, elena we we can maybe speak to this but we don't have a formal process defined now i think with some of the staff turnover and also um in general the permitting kind of takes the, the permitting takes up much of the staff's time and the commission's time so i think matters like this in open space management in general may fall by the wayside sometimes um and that's recognized in the MACC handbook as well. Um, <clears throat> and part of that as well as as we're kind of improving on past systems, um, we're also putting together uh, a list of area, like a list of conservation restriction, uh, conservation restrictions that we want to um, check on and, and ideally do an annual visit for each one of them. Um, and we also want to go ahead and uh, start to sort out who a current point of contact is, because I think that's one of the other issues is sometimes if we haven't touched mm -hmm. base with folks in a number of years, um, honestly, there might be property managers who don't even realize that this is something that they need to be thinking about. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully creating a system that allows for accountability um, on our end, and then also allows for sort of a, a, a plan for these property managers or whoever else it might be who's, um, you know, meant to be taking care of of this land um, and and may not even know it. So hopefully creating a system where where they also <laughs> know that this is something that should be on their radar. Because we've run into that as well where folks had no idea. Yep. Do we have a list of the conservation restrictions now? I think we should. Um, I don't think that it's fully up to date. So that's something that we're working on currently. I, is there like a plan? for to to have that like an ETA or something 
Uh, yes, as as soon as humanly possible. <laughs> That's been we've been uh, yeah we've been updating some systems, which has been exciting. Um, the, the calendar for next year, and then also going through and and sorting out um, outstanding uh, enforcement issues, and and also keeping track of our CRs is, is part of that. So we're hoping to have that up and running um, before definitely before the new year. Um, so sometime probably realistically between now and and the middle of December. Great, that's great to hear. And on any open issues like this during the administrative update period, if you could just let us know where that is, I think that'd be helpful. Absolutely, definitely. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Herbst. Um, is there anything you would like us to do at this point or on this topic or, or just giving us a heads up? More of a heads up, just want to let you know um, that, that this was a site visit that that happened and that we're that we're looking into and following up and also mostly that that this is um this site visit is kind of informing how we want to start organizing our information um on our end so so also just updating you on on um hopefully having a better system again truly to, to try to make sure that we're hitting um ideally at least once a year all of all of these sites yeah and i think everybody has varying amounts of times but as so often seems the case, this is not far from my house. So I'm happy to poke around some of these places. And I'm also curious whether this was meant to be public access. Yes. Uh, you... If I may, yeah. Uh, the you. area one marked on the plan is meant for public access. Area two, which is on the northern bank, is not. Okay. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I actually didn't answer part of Commissioner Conan's question which was um, that this site has been under, you know, not scrutiny, but under the watchful eyes of um, some community members, including also staff from the Neponset River Watershed Association. So previous conservation staff, uh, Nick Moreno and Kate Othimer had done uh, a couple site visits um, a year or so ago to resolve public access uh, needs that also violated the provisions of the conservation restriction. Um, so there is, uh, there are folks who are, you know, watching over it, and uh, you'll remember Frank O'Brien, who um, brought some issues to our attention around maintenance. And um, that's good to know. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner Long. Yeah, I remember the Neponset um, Watershed Association um, complaining or filed a complaint about this. It was a few years back. Mm. Uh, on the enforcement, it's interesting. So. Um, Chapter 184, Section 32, the enforcement is um, uh, actually limited to bringing an injunction to comply. So it, we'd need the legal department to file an injunction or get injunctive relief to force the uh, um, grantor or the holder. Well, who would it be in this case? Whoever, whoever's supposed to comply, I'll leave it at that. Um, the only monetary thing is if we were successful, we could um, extract or collect attorney's fees. So I think that's set by statute. So I don't know if you'd be able to add on um, stipulated penalties, um, but it might be something for your legal department or um, commissioner along to look into. Okay, thank you. Elena, um, what's next? Uh, Nick, is that the Neponset River or Mother's Park that, that we embark? So it's the it's along the banks of the Mother Brook, but right adjacent to where it um, has the confluence with the Neponset. Yeah. Right, and I think the Blake Estates they must have turned over their manager five times. I mean, they probably don't even know that they have a requirement. So we got to approach it with that in mind. I agree. Yeah, I think um, at this point it's a, it's a case of just the that them needing more notice and contact. Yeah. And, yeah, so we're, we're just getting there at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Elena, is that it for administrative updates? Uh, one more administrative update was going to be on the calendar for 2024. I just wanted to explain a little bit more about um, the, the changes that we're making and hopefully the improvements that that'll see for both commission staff and for our applicants. Um, so I also just wanted to check in. I, I, I had sent it out. I just wanted to make sure everyone had had a chance to review it and didn't see um, uh, that that everybody had a, excuse me had a chance to uh, look through them and make sure there weren't any conflicts. I believe we taken into account um, city holidays and um, also tried to work around um, 
especially the the 4th of July. I know that that was that was one of the issues from this year. So um, the big ch uh, two major changes that are happening are uh, that we are building in a designated site visit day so that all new filings would get a site visit um, from commission staff. And that's also an opportunity for any commissioners who um, have interest um, in, in a particular project or, or in all of them <laughs> to, to join us for those site visits. Uh, and so we'd be able to do that before the hearing and, and have more context for the project. Um, and then in, uh, in addition to that, we're also shifting the filing deadline. So currently, the way that our filing deadline works is that it is on the same Wednesday evening that we have our hearings. And we are required to get um, ads, draft ads to the Boston Herald by Friday, which means that we basically have 48 hours um, in between, well, less than that, um, we basically have from Wednesday evening to Friday afternoon to um, review uh, these filings, to get feedback to the applicants, um, which is something that we're not required to do, but we prefer to do so that we can, you know, help them get on the agenda more efficiently. And, um, and then give them time to get us review. So reasonably what that looks like is that we come into the office on Thursday, we review all of the filings, we get feedback back to folks, and then they usually have about 24 hours um, to get things back to us. So the new uh, timeline is going to allow for uh, a little bit more time for staff to do our review, and then also more time for applicants to get revised materials to us. So the new filing deadline is going to be Fridays at noon. Um, we would not be <laughs> we would not be giving people homework for the weekend, um, but we would be hoping to get them feedback on Monday or Tuesday, assuming there's not a holiday on Monday or Tuesday, um, but getting them feedback at the beginning of the week so that they have a few additional days um, to get that feedback or those revised um materials back to us based on our feedback by by Friday. And so we're hoping that this will just create a, a more streamlined process um, for for us and also just give our applicants like a, a more reasonable turnaround time because right now everybody's a little bit crunched for time. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about about this process. as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, any quick, questions? I have a quick one. Just um, I'm sure the calendar's fine and it all sounds great to me. But if you at least the email I got didn't have an attachment if you actually might wanted to Oh no! To look at the calendar itself. Um, Mine didn't either. I didn't get an attachment. But I do trust you to put together a perfectly fine oh. schedule. <laughs> that that'll inspire. <laughs> I was like, oh wow, this is fine with everybody. That's great. Um, okay, well in that case, I will send that to you all tonight. Um, I will send you an email again, and it will have a calendar attached to it, and that'll be. So, so just for clarity, then it's, we're talking about the Friday noon before the Wednesday of the hearing. So Friday noon, so this would be um, the different permitting cycles. So Friday at noon for permits that wouldn't be on Wednesday's uh, agenda, but would be on the agenda two and a half weeks from Friday. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, by the way, Frank's hand has been up, but it may be for the previous item. Yeah, okay. Um, let's just finish this discussion. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, Frank. Yeah, hi, good evening, everybody. Frank O'Brien. Uh, just very briefly, I know it's late on the um, the Blake Estates conservation restriction. Um, I think it's important to go on record in writing to Blake Estates. It's pretty easy to get the contact information. Um, I really appreciate the staff coming out to the field um, because in part, failure to enforce the CR could be argued to be a waiver of their requirement to maintain the site. It's a very sensitive site. It's on the Neponset, as was mentioned, as well as Mother Brook. Um, and then the second thing is typically they're given an opportunity to fix it, you know, to cure. And um, thereafter, as Chair Parker mentioned, that would be the next step would be to court. But there's interim steps and I really, you know, we're here to help as is Neponset River Watershed and would urge this as well as all the other CRs to become a joint priority for the commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And you can rest assured there's no doctrine of waiver for enforcement of CRs, at least nothing I've ever seen. Um, and then we have next, go ahead, Ellen. Uh, just one more update. So on um, okay. regulations drafting, just wanted to share that 
we um, are looking at the first three months of 2024 being process improvement. So this calendar, we're going to test it out for the first few months, make sure that this is actually solving some of the problems that we're having and <laughs> not creating more. Um, it's one of our uh, one of the first steps that we're taking to sort of make this process more navigable for folks, and um, and then to just go through, make sure that we're updating the materials on our website, um, and hopefully hearing feedback as well from from applicants, both from um, hopefully individual applicants who are going through the process not as regularly, as well as from um, from consultants who are you know regularly coming to concom hearings and hearing what we could be doing to sort of better accommodate them um and uh and then after that we're as we sort of improve that process before we get back into regs drafting um we're then planning on picking up regulations drafting in april so that's the sort of timeline is to hopefully improve internal processes um and then start to think about um start to think about regulations which is exciting great thank you Thank you. Um, Parker. I, Chair, I had a question. It's a legal question. Yeah. When we go out oh, to the boy. site and we have a majority of commissioners there, are we violating the open meeting law if we're discussing something? We uh, are. We are. That's why we limit um, site visits to three. Okay. I'll, good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, just quickly on that doctrine of waiver, um, the reason I don't have it, uh, it's not applicable in conservation restrictions is because precisely because what Commissioner Long was um, alluding to before, uh, very difficult to monitor. Um, sometimes you can't see what's going on pretty far into a into a restricted area. So it's unfair to um, impose waiver under those conditions uh, because a lot of what's going on is out of sight. Um, okay. Next thing is this uh, notice of intent. I see Stella is here, and apparently she has not gone rogue yet. Um, are we ready to vote on this, or is this going to be subject to that um, meeting that's coming up on Friday? Good evening, Commission. Um, thank you. Yes, I think um, the snow management snow removal plan and the perpetual maintenance conditions is something that DCR is, um, you know, does want to discuss at this meeting on Friday. So I suppose we will ask that this also, these conditions also be um, continued to the next hearing after this meeting on Friday. Unless, unless the commission would accept we want to go <laughs> wrong. You want to go Um, I don't think so. Let's see what happens on Friday. But thank okay. you for uh hanging in uh and to discuss this with us. Um okay. So we'll see what happens. Um okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, well, good night. Great. Have a good night. Um, last item on the agenda is acceptance of meeting minutes from I don't think it's all of those. I reviewed November 1st and September 20th. Correct. Yes, those are the two. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I'd entertain a motion. and I reviewed them. I made some edits. I would entertain a motion to accept the meeting minutes from September 20th, 2023 and November 1st, 2023. So moved. We have a second. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? I abstain. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. I vote aye, so that carries uh, four zero with one abstention. Um, okay, with that, uh, uh, motion to adjourn by acclamation. Any objection? Okay, thank you, everyone. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, and see you. Uh, see you in a few. Happy Thanks, everyone. Take care.